A major new legal blow for Donald Trump in a case involving one of the many non-disclosure agreements his former aides were asked to sign. A New York arbitrator ruling in favor of Omarosa Manigault Newman calling the NDA unenforceable because of vague and indefinite language that didn't meet common legal standards. Trump's campaign is now on the hook for her year's worth of legal fees with this case filed back in 2018. And joining me now is Omarosa Manigault Newman, former senior White House official under President Trump and, of course, author of the number one New York Times bestseller, Unhinged, an insider's account of the Trump White House, the book, of course, at the center of that legal battle. Welcome, Omarosa. I'm so glad to talk to you about this. I immediately thought of you and thinking I've got to get her on the show and talk about this because this is a huge win for you. I mean, are you feeling a little bit like David against Goliath here? And how much does Donald Trump have to pay to cover your legal fees? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on. I would love to say that I feel relieved, but remember, this is just one of two lawsuits that Donald Trump brought against me. He also weaponized the Justice Department and filed suit against me in, in that case. And so as much as I'm glad that this long three-year battle, very expensive three-year battle is over, I'm still wrangling uh, with that lawsuit that he filed through the Justice Department. Do you think anything about this lawsuit helps you in a favorable way with the second one? Well, certainly I believe that now people can see that um, this type of lawsuit was clearly retaliatory um, and, and no other explanation but Donald Trump wanted revenge. And he did so while sit, being a sitting president, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. is unprecedented to go after his political rivals or people who criticized him while sitting in the Oval Office. And so certainly I believe that in my other case, um, folks will take note and see that it's um, probably the third or fourth case brought under that particular mm -hmm. act. And the fines are extraordinary. They're asking for $60,000 when it should be like a, a $100 fine. So hopefully it'll be resolved soon. And I can, in fact, feel relieved that finally these battles are over. Yeah. I'm curious, you make a very good point that the suits were brought against you while uh, President Trump was a sitting president. And you won this mm -hmm. case, the one we're talking about, based on the filing, not meeting certain legal standards. We're talking about the president of the United States hiring attorneys to work for him. What does that say yes. about Trump's legal team? Well, I think it it says that Donald Trump is going to just grab attorneys who may not be concerned about getting paid because we know that he is not um, consistent in paying his counsel. So I don't know that he always hires um, the best counsel, but it also says uh, something about Donald Trump's concerns. Like, why would you spend $3.7 million trying to silence me? It just, you know, it makes no sense. So you have to ask the question, what was it he was afraid that I would share about the 17 years that I've worked with him, that I've been in his orbit and that I've seen him act in ways that are just quite um, unhinged. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you have the title. Uh, <laughs> as you know, Trump filed suit against you. Uh, again, pardon me, there's another high profile suit recently brought against uh, Donald Trump's niece, as well as the New York Times. Do you think your victory sets some sort of a precedent now? I mean, what does this mean overall for Trump's NDAs with other former aides? Well, there was a case prior to mine, uh, the Denson case, that also kind of helped my case. And I think together, my case and the Denson case does, in fact, invalidate all of those useless NDAs that really were designed to just allow Donald Trump to be the arbiter of what was confidential and what could be shared. And not only did these um, NDAs have this far reach, but they were forever. So he was uh, seeking to keep me silent for the rest of my life. Yeah. Well, let's move now to the upcoming new book by former Trump press secretary and campaign aide Stephanie Grisham. The title is I'll Take Your Questions Now, What I Saw in the Trump White House. In an excerpt, Omarosa, that was attained by NBC News, Grisham writes, when Trump met with Vladimir Putin in Japan in 2019, he told him, quote, OK, I'm going to act a little tougher with you for a few minutes, but it's for the cameras. And after they leave, we'll talk. You understand. And then according to a manuscript obtained by The New York Times, Grisham writes Trump's temper was, quote, terrifying and that she saw how his temper wasn't just shock value or for the cameras. And, and here's one more to consider. The New York Times reporting Grisham details how Donald Trump yelled at Melania Trump for wearing that jacket that said, I really don't care, do you? Telling her, quote, here's the quote, what the hell were you thinking? You know, Trump has come out criticizing his former 
top aide, saying in part that Grisham wrote bad and untrue things about him and said she'd become very angry and bitter after a breakup. But to you, Omarosa, does any of what Grisham writes surprise you? Do you believe this is an honest accounting or the words of someone who's angry and bitter? Well, they sound very familiar because their revelations I already wrote about three years ago in my book. I mean, you'll recall yeah. that I shared about his reaction to the jacket, that I shared that Donald Trump had this tremendous temper. And sometimes if you're on the receiving end of it, it was quite terrifying. And at the time when Stephanie was in the office and I shared these revelations, she called them all lies. She said that they weren't true. And then here she is writing the same exact tales, just in a different book with a different cover. So um, I don't know what her motivation is. I had a good relationship with Stephanie. Uh oh, she, can you hear me? I hear a, the control room. No, I'm um, sorry, she, uh, that was a mistake. <laughs> what, what was your relationship with Stephanie? You said you had a good relationship with her. I did. I mean, let's just call it what it is. Stephanie was the ultimate party girl on the campaign. That's when I met her. She was the fun girl. She liked to drink and party and have a good time. And so that's kind of how I knew her. As a communications um, staffer, she was mediocre at best. But um, we saw that because she was afraid to take questions. She never had a press conference. I mean, it, it just kind of is what it is. So now she's writing a book. Some of the revelations are comical that's come out, but I'd like to see the full book once it comes out. I wish mm -hmm. her well, but a lot of these stories have already been told, Alex. So, th so then here's a question, uh, and I'll ask at the end, because according to the New York Times, Grisham writes in her book that she should have spoken up more. There's a new uh, New York Times opinion piece. Columnist Frank Bruni says, sorry, Stephanie Grisham, you are not redeemed. So in your mind, Omarosa, is she looking for redemption? And I guess here's the question. Beyond the money, why does anyone write a Trump tell-all? Why did you? Because look at what you go through. I mean, look what mm -hmm. happened. You got a lawsuit. I mean, it's not an easy process to write that book, put it out there, publicize it, and then wait and see what happens. I wrote my book because the truth matters. And I worked for the American people and I believe that they had a right to know what was happening in the Oval Office, on Air Force One, in the cabinet room. What was it like when this president was making decisions that would impact each of their lives? They had a right to know what was going on behind the scenes. That's why I wrote the book, because the truth matters. Okay, what about the House Select Committee that's investigating the January 6th attack on the Capitol, issuing, as you know, 11 more subpoenas, all for people who helped organize the rally right before the mob went on the attack. Among them, 2016 Trump campaign spokesperson Katrina Pearson. I've interviewed her. I know that you know her. Are you surprised by this? I'm not really surprised because not only was Katrina one of the um, organizers, but she was behind the money. You know, in every scandal, it's always follow the money. And because she was so involved with raising money and organizing the events, I believe the committee is right in subpoenaing her. She's going to have a lot of information and shed a lot of insight on what they knew and when. And I truly believe because of Donald Trump's violent instincts that he knew that things would probably get out of hand. So, yes, Katrina should be very concerned and we'll see what happens. But the committee is on the right track. Do you think what Katrina has to say, what potentially the other four Trump advisors who were previously served, that includes Steve Bannon, do you think mm -hmm. what these people have to say could potentially incriminate Donald Trump? And if so, who has that kind of evidence or experience, if you will? And will they say it if they appear before the committee? Well, don't you think that Donald Trump has already incriminated himself? I mean, just by virtue of the fact that he would not take the steps to protect the Capitol on that day, that he refused to call up the National Guard, that he did not care that his vice president was in peril. But certainly, if these folks will come forward and tell the truth, then all roads point back to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, and Donald Trump was closely uh, involved and spearheading this effort. Okay. Well, uh, that's a wrap for this time. I'll look forward to seeing you again, Omarosa. Thank you so much. We'll name the, uh, re remind folks about the book again. It's Unhinged, an insider's account of the Trump White House. Again, the book at the center of this battle, which you just won. Thank you.